Thank you everyone for coming back to another series of the NL seminar at ISI. Uh, let me just, okay. Uh, today we have Yu Tian from um, UCLA come to talk, uh, come giving us a talk on harnessing black box control to boost common sense in LM's generation. Uh, Yu Fei is a PhD student at UCLA uh, advised by Professor Nanyan Peng. Um, her research is centered around creative and controllable text generation. Um, I, Yufei and I actually interned at the same time in 2019 at ISI. Um, I just remember that. So um, it's great to have her back. And I'm super um, excited to um, hear about her talk. So okay, please welcome Yufei. Well, I'm really excited to be back after five years almost. Um, so I'm going to talk about our very recent work on harnessing black box control to boost the common sense in language models generation. And um, hopefully it's not that outdated. It's like a one year and a, one year and old. So um, the motivation is very simple. Despite the remarkable progress of large language models, uh, there have been some criticism around its failing to understand common sense and basically just a lot of criticism around common sense in general. So, um, and for example, there have been criticism on what, like what it understands, it cannot generate, and uh, vice versa, what it generates, it cannot understand. Um, in this, okay, it's not working. In this question answering task, um, if we ask, do lions live in an ocean? Like language models, I believe this is GPT three, like not the three point five version. It's gonna ask answer no, which is correct. But if in a, a constraint generation task, if we ask it to generate a sentence that will include lion located at ocean, all of these keywords, it still generates lions will live in an ocean, uh, which is contradicting uh, each other. So um, this is a very, uh, really motivates us to look into how well we can leverage on like not human labels, but really all of the language model itself's knowledge to try to improve itself. Um, so the first challenge that we are tackling is that language models are not very reliable in generating commonsensical outputs. Um, this is the same task, which we will call it as a um, constraint common sense generation task, where uh, the inputs are always gonna be some concepts. Some of them are negatively related to each other. For example, why I live in the ocean or wear sunglasses at night, because you don't usually wear sunglasses at night, but like the task is to force the language model to must generate something that will include everything. Um, and the second task is more on uh, a very complicated uh, set of concepts. Like here we have food, customer, um, watch, employee, and prepare. All of these are kind of interconnected. You don't see uh, a clear indication in all of their concepts, but it's more on how you are gonna uh, connect them in the most plausible way. We do see that GPT-2 and GPT-3 both generate that the employee watch the customer prepare food. This is because we put customer, uh, okay, sorry. This is because if we um, simply swap the order, the, uh, the objects of these sentences are also gonna be swapped. So if we, if we keep customer uh, before uh, employee and inputs, it's probably gonna be generating that the customer are watching the employees doing this. But if we swap the order, and the employee here and the customer uh, in a later part, then both of them are going to be easily influenced. I'm just gonna say, okay, the, now the employee are watching the customer. So okay. can I just, yeah. uh, isn't very here. Uh -huh. right, so your front, the, the task you're trying to solve is to generate sentences that do not have any more engine. Is that correct? Do not have like the most plausible sense, the most reasonable. Right. So ideally no orange. Uh, orange right. is like that. Right, and, right. And, and you were just talking about this ordering thing. So, you also want roughly the, the uh, provided concepts to occur in the order they are provided? No, we don't have this concept. Basically, if we swap the order of customer and employee, it doesn't affect the ground truth that uh, it's very unlikely that the customer will prepare the food themselves while the employee watch themselves. So we want the model to be very robust in that no matter the position of the input concepts, we want it all to be always the same. Yes. Got it. And uh, you're presumably going to tell us how you figure out whether something is possible. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, these are some of the uh, examples that motivate us to speak. Um, and another uh, challenge is as large language models get really, really large, it's really difficult for us, especially as 
graduate students in universities to fine tune the entire model. Um, this is um, a very quick calculation done by me. If you want to find your 7 billion model, or not, if you want to do inference on a 7 billion model, this is the amount of uh, a GPU memory you're going to use. And if you want to fine tune, it's usually two to four times larger, depends on optimizer you use. And as this is a little bit outdated, but just to show you that the model size is exploding. This is on the um, computation size um, and the other, which is a little bit um, small here. Hopefully, hopefully it's not blocked. Basically, I'm trying to argue that we also do not want to collect data set for each, uh, collect label data for each of the tasks we're trying to improve. Let's say today I want to improve uh, this constraint generation task. Do I need to collect label data, thousands of label data for this task, uh, just to fine tune on this task? And let's say tomorrow I will do another task, which is actually similar, still centered on common sense, this is not, not on this constraint generation, but do I need to collect a very new set of label data on this? Uh, definitely we do not want to do this because it's very expensive and it's not very time costly. So uh, okay, any questions before I go into the solutions? Cool. Um, with all these, what we did for this work is try to have a very computational and also labor efficient way to improve the common sense of a pre-trained um, language model in a plug and play manner. So in order to do this, the first we did is to build a so-called reference-free scorer. We can just view it as an evaluator uh, or a reward model that will tell us how common sensical, like by the way, CS here means common sensical, uh, to evaluate how common sensical a sentence is. Um, and uh, after that, we actually uh, are uh, rely on the very recent development of controllable generation on a theoretical side um, that um, we can actually train a very small auxiliary model to control a, a frozen uh, large language model by training on its self-generated samples. The self-generated samples are um, suboptimal, but if we uh, combine it with a Oracle score, which knows what a good sentence is, uh, we show that we're able to um, um, improve its common sense aspects. Um, so the rest of the talk will be divided into two parts. Um, the first is very uh, a detailed walkthrough into how we build this common sense evaluator. And the second part will be uh, based more on the guided generation process. I would like to be a little bit divergent on the first half, um, like what's gonna be the uh, potential next steps for the common sense evaluator in general. And after, uh, after the second half, we'll just look into the results. Okay, just feel free to just stop me whenever you have questions. This is a very high level overview of how we build a common sense score. It is interpretable and it's just like a neural symbolic. So let me give a very high level introduction. The first step is to going to be extract a lot of tuples uh, from a sentence. For example, here we have an input sentence telling us to kill an apple, uh, both with a drill and with, with a pillar. Um, we would like to extract everything that has been implied by the sentence, no matter if they are correct or not. Um, so here it is implied from the sentence that the drill can be used to kill an apple. It is also implied that the pillar can be used to kill an apple. Basically, um, we immediately know that um, this one is not possible, but um, we want to extract everything that has been implied. And after that, we want to have a, a Zaya score for each of the individual tuples, which is the assumption that the sentence made um, by grounding them into a uh, knowledge base. And uh, after that, we simply aggregate the tuple level scores into the sentence level scores. For example, here, this one is probably gonna get a really, really bad score, close to zero. And this one is going to get a near perfect score. And if we take the average, something like 27. Um, so um, let's take a look step by step. The first step is about tuple extraction. Um, the format we have is actually triplet where we were gonna have a half concept or event like draw and the relation type. For example, used for is a relation type and the other is a tell event or tell concept, which is to uh, pill apples. These are the three components of each individual tuple that we're gonna extract. And um, we tried to compare to uh, ways. One is directly use uh, GPT 3.5 to help us do this um, extraction. Um, and the other is try to uh, do this model distillation and uh, teach uh, a smaller model, which is the T5 model to do this. And um, remember again that our goal is to parse all of the possible tuples that has been indicated or 
uh, implied from the original sentence, uh, regardless of their correctness. So we would like to need uh, have a lot of negative samples um, because if all of the input sentences that the model is trained on are very reasonable, chances are that if we have a uh, less reasonable sentence, the model failed to identify those uh, tuples. Hopefully it's clear now. Um, so we have to have these negative samples. And in order to do this, we have some um, kind of data augmentation technique. Um, we assume the human rhythm ones are more reasonable, more common sensible. So we have around 3,000 uh, sentences that are human rhythm. And we also have another uh, 3,000 uh, less coherent and less common sensible samples, which is actually sampled from a base GPT-2 model. Um, and the one caveat here is that, uh, like I said, we started with uh, this few shot GPT 3.5 model, um, and we want to distill or want to teach the smaller model to do this. Uh, but as we go on, we, I believe we started with around uh, 13 different relation types. So U score is going to be one relation type. Table of is going to be another relation type. We started with uh, like more than uh, 10. Uh, uh, relation types, but uh, as we proceed with GPT 3.5, we realize that it's actually not great at uh, extracting everything. There are a few simpler relation types that's doing great job, for example, at the location or some thing is capable of doing something, this type of objects, uh, relation types, but it's really bad at more of the uh, event level or causal uh, relationships, for example, motivated by the goal or cause the desire to do something. Um, and um, because we don't have a better model, if we want to be really uh, labor efficient, we have to kind of prune all of the other relation types that GPT-4 is not great at and focus on this uh, relatively simple relations that the teacher model is good at. No, this is like, uh, there is an existing data set, which is, uh, which is the generative common sense reasoning task. The input is going to be the uh, concepts and the output is uh, actually the human captions of some image. So we just directly use that data set. And do you have some kind of prompt to do the GPT-2 generated ones? Or is it the yes. same, same task? The same task. But GPT-2, if we don't find tune GPT-2 enough, it's going to be a really bad model. Right. And we are, deliberately are, are don't. Are we or like? Somewhat. So this is a great question. The base GPT-2 model is not a vanilla GPT-2 model. It is fine-tuned on, I believe, less than one epoch on, on our task. So that it still learns the task, but not, its output is not very reasonable. <laughs> but is it really in the world of like horse riding bikes and whatever? This is all uh, machine written, yeah. right? Yeah, and also, that correct? It's not correct. Like, filling apple is a drill and pillar. I believe this is a actually this is a fine tuned GPT two version. Like fine tuned the best is still generate something like that because the input is clearly asking you to generate a sentence that will contain both a drill and a pillar. This is the constraint that you are going to see. Um, uh -huh. this already, but um, <clears throat> how are you extracting relations using GPT four? Are you uh, just like prompting with this? Right. There is. Basically, it's just prompting, but it's few shot prompting. And we uh, did a lot of effort on trying to find what are the great examples. We had nine manually tested examples uh, as a few shot setting, and each of them will cover different aspects because for one sentence, you can imagine there are multiple uh, tuples that can be extracted. So it's really like uh, manually playing with them and try to find the optimal prompt for it. Okay. And then, yeah, she just generates the, the two Right, right. And we do have a uh, breakdown of the uh, performance. It's not mentioned here, but in general, GPT 3.5, the gen uh, overall F1 score for extracting everything is 79%, which is reasonable. And for our smaller model, which is pseudo model, it reaches 73%, I think. So it's reasonable, it's not perfect. And also it's only based on those simpler relations. Do you have more extremely, extremely versions of things that are not common sense? Like, for example, in particular, I mean, Bill Apple and Bill and Pillar is totally feasible, right? Like, you put, like, that's the way a, 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 like a high speed Apple Pillar works. You basically put the Apple <laughs> on the drill, and the only Pillar is constant, you just turn the Apple with the drill. I cannot argue that it's not possible at all, but I mean, we're trying I mean, to. You probably have really, really crazy examples we could use instead, right? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Ye
it's different but convey exactly the same meaning. The employee washed and the customer prepared the food. Uh, the extracted two bowls are the same for these two sentences. So all uh, the scores we get are the same. And the, for the last one, we have employee prepared the food in the score while the customer watched, which has a, a higher score. And for the second one, we have and eat telephone. Like we know that telephone is inedible. So for the first one, we have the ant was seen eating a telephone. The second one, the ant was eating out the phone as if it were a delicious snack. Both of them get a relatively low score. Um, and the last one is uh, better. Okay, hopefully it's clear. Um, yeah, go ahead. So sorry, just to make sure I'm separately. So in these cases, the things that goes to get matched is common is, for example, in the second case is at eat something and then we look up all those yes. in comments and then say uh, like calculate similarities to telephone and fly and uh, right right well yeah it's just so like if you have ant eat say ant eat and fly right that's what you would extract that's what i extract and then so you you do ant eat whatever yes and then you compare all the whatever yeah and fly. exactly whatever the closest thing is exactly is that exactly so exactly that. right okay Um, okay. And um, correlation with humans, we do have, let me explain, don't worry if you don't understand this. So we have some baseline models we want to compare, which are all uh, reference uh, based, which is the media versus score. Uh, for one, always like the data set we use, like I said, it's a image capturing data set. They have multiple round truths for each single input. So we have on average four different human outputs uh, for the same input. and. Um, most of them have reasonable correlation with humans. And for us, um, we have different versions of the old score T5 is basically T5 doing the extraction, GPT 3.5 doing the extraction. What is gold? Gold is like we as a, a humans, so we uh, extract the tuples ourselves. And we would view this as the upper bound of the method that we propose where uh, T5 and GPT are just the, if they are lower than so that, it's just that the model is not perfect yet. And we just see uh, taking the mean, which is like taking the average of every single uh, tuple correlates uh, well with human. Um, okay, I'm going to, no questions? So, oh. so the point is that you can get about as good as reference base. Yeah, it's actually better. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit more. It's probably, it's, the reference based ones are really dependent on the quality of the references you got. And for that, specific data set we are using, the uh, ground truths are not super diverse and not super high quality, so that it's affecting its uh, performance with human. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so far so good. I'm going to have a quick summary of our common sense evaluator. The pros are, uh, so by the way, uh, before us, we're not aware of any uh, common sense evaluator, uh, but there's a concurrent work of ours, which is published at the same venue, uh, which is called Vera from the UW group. What they do is they are actually collecting a lot of data and they try a, a model on, I believe, 7 million sentences. And compared to uh, a very uh, data-driven framework, the pros for, of our uh, model is we are more interpretable and we're also task agnostic because we don't rely on uh, any uh, like we don't have shift domains domain shift um, but on the other side we do have some cones first of all uh, we are very limited to a few relation types which are uh, so far the best that GPT can do and also it's a little bit indirect in that we have multiple steps if we have an arrow that occurs in the very first stage it's going to propagate until the end so this is a comparison between our work and the concurrent work of ours. Um, and so what, what, what's next about this common sense score before I go into how we uh, uh, do this constraint generation? Uh, the first is that um, you can definitely use this as a tool or you can try to improve uh, the other relation types because like I said, only a very few uh, relation types are working very well now. But um, there is a, uh, another direction that I would like to uh, mention which is to uh, apply this very similar idea into the physical common sense domain. So uh, we all know that large language models are getting really great at common sense now, at social interactions now, but not that great at uh, physical. Uh, and in the past one or two years, people have been building large language models with more models, 
for example, web browsing, game playing, or even as a brain for all of all of them, they, it's easy to evaluate, but not as great as if you're simply building a physical uh, world model to do some tasks. Let me give, uh, give you this example. So uh, in this task, uh, the, uh, the task is about to roll a dough evenly, but you do not have a rolling pin. And there are a list of uh, potential tools that you, you can use. We all, and the large language models are actually doing a bad job in saying, uh, proposing to use the common tower uh, as a makeshift rolling pin. So the question is, can we verify this physical possibility of a generative text uh, uh, using similar idea of uh, like breaking this down into simple uh, components and try to uh, evaluate the possibility or uh, the physical feasibility of each of the proposed action. Uh, I would call it object attribute centered reasoning, but this I like, and see how well we can uh, adopt a similar idea. So we all we already see that uh, LMs are prone to making this type of errors. Um, and um, the question is really, can we borrow some ideas from this uh, interpretable and neurosymbolic evaluator uh, to have uh, a new um, score that's going to evaluate the physical possibility? And I, I would see a high potential uh, if we can devise something like this. OK, um, I think it's time to pause for questions. This is a good answer, right? What's the bad answer? Um, this one? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it really depends on if you have a kettle and you boil the water, you have a very small zone where the steam will go out. How would you put the pizza on top of this um, kettle? It's not mentioned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you move the kettle underneath the pizza. Okay, that's possible. <laughs> Right, but I, I would say this one is probably most efficient. <laughs> if no more questions, we'll just go ahead and uh, take a look at our guided generation process. Um, so a little bit background, this is just a disclaimer. Uh, the theoretical finding is not based on us, but from a previous work. Um, so we are, based on a recent theoretical development on controllable generation, which proposed to use um, auxiliary models to steer a free train model uh, by training on its self-generated samples. Um, it, the idea is somewhat similar to the RLAIF process where you will have a reward model. In this case, it's gonna be an Oracle score, like in general, uh, which is going to give a scale of value which you can do in the reward. And then uh, the objective is always to maximize the reward that you're gonna get. So this high level idea is very similar to our elf in general. Um, but the difference is that here, there, uh, what we train on is a uh, predictive function, which is called RO here. No worries if you do, do not understand the pipelines here because we're gonna go back. So uh, very uh, intuitively, we will have these two blue boxes, which are fixed and that's what we already have. And for each input sentence, we're gonna, uh, for each input constraint, which is not a sentence, we will ask the language model, pre-trained language model to generate uh, uh, numerous samples. And for each of them, we're gonna get a scores. What does this uh, orange box do? Orange box is a predictive function that is going to uh, predict the expected reward that the incomplete sentence will get. So. Remember the RR goal score will only uh, evaluate, be able to tell you a uh, very reasonable uh, judgment if it sees a complete sentence. But at the inference time, we only see uh, an incomplete sentence, which are, which are the tokens that have generated so far. Basically, this predictive function here tried to bridge this gap by learning to predict the expected reward of an incomplete sentence when it is complete. This is the intuition, no worries if you don't understand because we're going to the very formal uh, definition. Uh, so let's go back. We're going to have an old oracle value, which will tell you a score given the input x and y. And then we'll have a predictive function. What it does is it's going to predict the uh, given an incomplete sentence, which is uh, let's assume we're at the p prime token. 
So given an input and an incomplete sentence, what it does is simply to predict the expected O score, the expected reward, um, given this incomplete sequence when it is complete. This is um, this why it just means when the sentence is complete. And um, is it clear? When you, when you say some of a Y, is that the completion or just a single sentence? So if it has no uh, other stuff, like Y itself just means a complete complete sequence. Right, so I'm saying that Y itself is not a one children, it's, it's several children. So right, it, it's a complete sequence, it's several children. Right. Correct. Presumably this is a piece of sample. Exactly, this is, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but this is very well defined. Like, you know what this learns, but in, 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 in practice, it's not possible. But this is well-defined with blurs. And uh, so what, where does the uh, controllable theory come from? So there is a uh, previous work that actually shows if we are, we already have this RO, which is a predictive function, the optimal output that's so gonna optimize the O value uh, um, is going to be uh, in this equation, uh, don't worry. So this P is just this P, so this P is just a P here, which is a tree language model. So basically it says that the optimal slot just is going to be uh, the pre-train language model of logic uh, multiplied by some other term. And some other term is actually uh, two versions of our other predictive function, uh, predictive function. And to take a closer look, let's say we're at this current step of T prime, uh, capital T prime, and uh, this one is what has been generated already. So this is a constant, which will, which will be fixed. And this being that if we're just doing the sampling process, we'll simply ignore this factor. And then this whole term is going to be proportional to the uh, multiplication of the RO and the original uh, language model. Yes. Yeah. monotonic change of RO as Y gets longer? It's, it's, it's going to change, but it's for a specific step as the inference time, this one. Uh, so for each specific step, you're going to update this. Right. But like, when you make the simplification of the next step, you're assuming you know, the reward. Basically, yeah, I'm assuming this one is a constant for every. Yeah, the denominator is constant, but the right. denominator could be, oh, sorry, you're ignoring your count. Right. Because it's, it's, it's the same for every single term that we're computing. And this is actually a clone. Is there another question? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a closed and unique form. Basically, this is the exact form. If we have this perfect uh, predictive function, this is the unique closed form solution that's going to uh, lead to the optimized uh, or max maximized O value. Uh, so far, so good, but uh, there has been already been identified. We have to have some sacrifice here. Nothing is perfect. Um, in theory, uh, we have this very well defined uh, predictive function. But uh, simply, there are infinite number of sequences, and we cannot enumerate everything. That's where the neural model came into place. We want to learn this based on a few uh, examples that we're able to gather. <coughs> this is where the approximation, the trade-off come from. <coughs> is that clear? Okay. Um, so everything here becomes a neural model, uh, which is actually a transformer, transformer model that you see later that try to learn this, everything. And um, there actually have been some techniques to help us better learn this uh, predictive function uh, from a uh, finite uh, set of sequences. One thing is try to improve the uh, self-sampling techniques. There have been, uh, I believe the or original paper, they use important sampling and actually for uh, RL, HF, they have the Monte Carlo search or whatever, try to improve, a, a, be a more efficient in sampling. And also uh, another tree caveat simply to have as large uh, constant n as possible, which means for the, the same input x, you want to have uh, the more uh, outputs the better. Uh, huh? you said this one. The oracle score just the common sense model. The oracle can be anything, but for us, is a is a oracle is a common sense score. And then the x's and y's are again like the input terms and then outputs. Yes, yes. This is like classifier kind of generation. Yes. With a classifier at the end of it. Yeah. So you mentioned that at the end of the day, your predictive function mm -hmm. is basically another transformer, right? Yes, but it's a lot smaller. Than it, it's a lot smaller. So if you go back to the closed form mm -hmm. solution, 
So intuitively, what it's saying is that it's the probability is output by the base pre-trained transformer. It's being weighted by another transformer yes. that that says, uh, "Hey, this is what you really want to generate." Yes. But given this scoring function, yeah. if you translate it, it's really better, or actually, it's worse. Yeah, <laughs> that's the intuition behind it. Basically, try to play with the awful logics to reweight them. So, but for example, one more case that like like where sunglasses night uh -huh. so, and like you start doing the eye wear sunglasses and like a bad transformer just are I wear sunglasses at night the context for which the context to which we find the indication that hey where is bad to generate is not until later in the sentence right because we have not at the end of the sentence yeah but because the our old model is trained on the entire sequence, so it has a little bit of look ahead in this because it's predictive. So during the training, it has seen this functions already. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oops. So just instantiate this theoretical framework into a common sense, a guided generation. Let me walk you through this pipeline. So. Um, the solid uh, lines here indicate the training process, and the uh, uh, dashed lines will indicate the inference process. The inference, let's, let me start with the inference process, where uh, we will have a PY, which is the uh, pre logins of a pre-trained language model, and the outputs of a auxiliary model, which is our old. And so what we're going to sample is simply the multiplication of these. This is the uh, inference time. There are two parallel um, forward passes. So what about the training time? The training time, uh, given us all of these possible inputs and the pre-trained language model, we're simply going to uh, sample as many uh, different outputs as possible. And then we uh, pass everything to this Oracle common sense score, get all of these scores, uh, note that everything is a complete sequence. So what this learns is basically to for every single sentence, it's gonna have a trunks of each incomplete sequences and try to learn this predictive value. This is what this uh, predictive model works. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, for, like why this approach versus like uh, RLHF or, or, you know, variance. Is it like the lack of, of preference data or? Uh, yes. So this is a great question. If I were given a second chance, I would probably not build this as a scalar value as it is. If I were given a second, because when I, when we started, we know very few about RL, AI or RHF in general. Uh, we we didn't know like that um, pairwise comparison might be a more uh, intuitive way for humans. And actually, we do uh, when we are building this Oracle score, although it's scalar, we still try to have a pairs of uh, sentences that's actually talking about the same input but have different quality. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, the values we get are indeed um, uh, like aligned with human preferences, but we didn't know that much, so we still have the skill of value. If I were given a second chance, or if you asked me uh, what can be a follow-up work, I would say just to replay this with the uh, pairwise comparison. Yeah, I model. guess, and like, where do, you feel, where do you see the field in general control the generation? Is it, is it always going to be pairwise early job or is there still a space for things like this that are classifier guided and single score guided? Oh, um, this is a great and hard question. I think we won't know until like empirically we test both and probably it also will depend. So for our, if we want to collect pairwise comparisons, a lot more, there is a lot more work to collect them. The reward, and also there is another caveat for pairwise comparison, which is like it's not consistent. If A is better than B and B is better than C, but it can be that A is worse than C. So like nothing is uh, coherent or consistent. This is some um, one drawback of com uh, pairwise comparison. Um, yeah, so everything has its pros and cons. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, so for yeah. this to work, you need the token distribution from the auxiliary model and the pre trained language model yes. to be the same, right? And if the you mean the out the vocabulary. The vocabulary, yes, they have to be the same. Yes. And, um, 
are the um, token distributions for um, like the logics for black box models like GPT-4 available? No. no. Um, so for GP smaller, like GPT-3, you will be able to have access to top 100 or 200. If you're, uh, by default, you only have five. But if you're from academia and if you apply, you're going to have a top 200 for a maximum. And I, I, I think for the top 200, it's able to be like a little bit play with it. But we didn't test on uh, this closed models, actually. Okay. Questions? Some more. Um, a little bit into our experimental settings. Um, there are two uh, benchmarks that we tested. One is more focusing on daily concepts and the other is more focusing on the neg negative relationships. Um, and um, the models that we tested are, are GPT-2, um, Slime T5, and Alpaca. So the reason why we want to have GPT-2 is it's uh, the smallest model and the base model is uh, doing a bad job in this work. And then for T Plan T5 and Alpaca, um, Plan T5 is encoder and decoder and Alpaca is uh, decoder only. For Alpaca, it's, it already has the ability to uh, generate something very simply without uh, training on anything. That's why we have this few shot and zero shot setting. But for GPT-2, we couldn't do any zero shot or few shots. We have this warm up. What does this warm up mean in this warm up is simply to train on a very small sample of data not to learn to generate very fluent, uh, coherently or commonsensically, but just to learn the uh, format of this task. It's more like instruction following, just to follow the task where you know that the input is gonna be some construct words and the output is gonna be a sentence, they include everything. We want the GPT-2 to warm up, not to learn to be commonsensical, but just to learn the task format. This is what we mean by warm up. Um, and um, the auxiliary model is usually eight to 10 times smaller than the free train language models. Basically, they will have the same architecture as a uh, base model that we use, but we just uh, uh, divide, like we just have a much less um, layers in general. And uh, the Oracle score, it can be very generic. We have the common sense uh, evaluator, which has been devised by us, but also remember it's a constrained generation task where you have to incorporate all of the keywords. We also try to multiply our common sense score with this lexical checking. Basically, if you generate something that's perfectly commonsensical, but you do not include any of the keyword constraints, you still get a zero because it's multiplied together. Um, and the, some baseline models that we compared, um, the first A star is the coding as um, inference time decoding method, which has a little bit of um, uh, search. And then we have this uh, others, which are more theoretical. And we also have a GPT-3 and ChatGPT version to compare with. Um, these are the results. Don't worry about this figure. It's not made for you to read any of those. So the first. Um, Finding we have is, uh, it is indeed effective in both, uh, in all of the three model architectures we, that we tested on, but we also find that our model brings more benefit into this instruction following models than let's say a GPT-2 model. Um, secondly, um, we find that similarity-based matrix have a low correlation with humans, again. So we have this blue, blue score, we have this coverage. We do see that when the coverage is really high, meaning that all of the tested samples, they somehow uh, are similar to the ground truth if we simply ca uh, compare the uh, word overlap rate. Um, in this case, the similarity-based scores have actually close to zero correlation with humans. Um, and the last thing we do find that for uh, Few shot setting, we tested few shot setting only on Alpaca, but we do see that for few shot settings, um, Alpaca few shots based on the improved by our model uh, uh, surpass the quality of a fine tuned uh, Alpaca model. Uh, and again, this is likely because of the quality of the data set that it is fine tuned. Oh, like I said, it is a little bit outdated. Uh, data set, which is uh, about image captioning. So the quality of the human references are not super great. So, yeah. What are you referring to here by similarity-based metrics? Similarity-based metrics, like a uh, reference-based matrix, like blue or red score, where you have the references. Right. Okay. So, right. so what's a not similarity-based metric? Uh, like a reference frame, like just the, the, our our. Is, like, is what it said common sense. Yes, common sense. So it could be 
Right. So one, one way you can measure common sense is by comparing your outputs with some human references. Yeah. If they have similarity, you assume they have better common sense. It might work in the past where model outputs aren't perfect. But now, as model outputs are better and better and better, this gets lower and lower correlation with humans in terms of common sense. Okay, and then the analog is your reference-free one. But then how are you um, controlling for a complete abandonment of, of relevance? So like an output could be um, uh, several words are wear sunglasses night. That's a commonsensical statement. Right. This is why we have to have, so in one thing, we still have to rely on the inherent ability of large language models to generate something that's fluent. That was, that was what I just said was fluent. No. Several words. Yes, it but, is the word uh, is but, air, sunglasses, night. Right, but let's, I would assume that a large enough language model won't generate something like a, words are wearing sunglasses, but still like some objects or uh, some people. I looked up the following words in the dictionary code. Where sunglasses, <laughs> <laughs> but it's commonsensical. So it is commonsensical, and in this case, our model, like the common sense score, cannot be able to detect this. This is true. Right. So we still have to rely on some of the inherent abilities of large language models. So right, these are two. So before us, people were would view this generative common sense reasoning task as a lexical constraint generation task, simply because. Researchers are hoping that large language models are able to magically generate something that's commonsensical if they follow all of these lexical constraints. And now, basically, we are doing the reverse. We realize that large language models are bad at common sense. So we have this external tool uh, to improve common sense. But in the meanwhile, we rely on this inherent ability to generate something that's when that's on, like, let's have very low probability generating words is wearing sunglasses. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it's the time. So 10 minutes great. So case study, this is the same example and it telephone. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is for this type of task where the relationships are more of negative relationships, uh, we do see some language models uh, fail to realize it. For example, even GPT-3, Da Vinci, the C is, says, and we see needing a telephone, uh, telephone uh, which is, Unfortunate for as our auto generates something like a, and eating a dead fly or and eating on the side of the telephone, which makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, for ChatGPT, what was the prompt? We just asked it to generate a common sensical sentence given all those uh, info so you specifically asked it to generate a speaker in common sense. Right, right, right. We have this. Um, and uh, for another one, don't worry about this, I'm going to explain. In the second example, it's more of how to connect everything in a reasonable uh, setting because none of these are contradictory to each other. We have table, dog, game, walk, fireplace. And um, it's, it's less clear here, but I want to uh, bring a few. For example, uh, A star is the code. It generates a group of people are walking and playing video games at their dining room with fireplace, tables, and dogs. It's reasonable, it's logical. And like nothing is bad, but it's a little bit weird because you see all of these uh, objects are bounded to the same people, which are uh, same ob uh, subject, which is our people. Um, and and this one, the dog walks around the table playing a game by the fireplace. Again, like there's one subject with a dog and then everything is just bounded to it. Um, I do want to bring up this one. Where is it? Okay. Uh, Boost, by the way, Boost is the name of our model. We have the joint, it's like the joint training of both common sense and lexical constraint. We have um, the dog walk around the table while we play the game by the fireplace. Um, it's a little bit obscure, but I want just, just want to mention this might uh, give a higher probability because not every single uh, object is bounded to the same person. Um, um, did you actually need to have two different Boost CS examples? Yeah. Oh, no, I think something is, yeah, I think my captions are wrong. It's the same sentence. It's the same sentence. And finally, some comparison with ChatGPT. We have an interesting finding that human annotators actually find ChatGPT more commonsensical by our model. Our model is based on Opa Kabai, um, but it also finds overall the 
they prefer our model. And we want to know why. Right. So uh, CS makes common sense. We have a pairwise comparison where we will show our model outputs and ChatGPT outputs. We ask two questions. One is which one do you think is more common sensical? And the other is like, what do you prefer in overall? So we cannot be ChatGPT in terms of common sense, but we have better overall quality. Um, and this is probably why, based on their feedback, it seems that ChatGPT is a little bit too correct, that people have less fun. So for example, wear sunglasses at night. ChatGPT simply tells you it's not advisable to do so uh, because it can impede your vision, increase the risk of accidents. Um, our model is actually, because the way that it's trained, it's never optimized to learn something like uh, the negations. So we try to generate a scenario uh, which makes everything plausible. So our model generates someone wears sunglasses at night to avoid the bright lights of the approaching car. And imagine you're a human annotator and you read uh, a thousand, or no, sorry, a, a hundred. Uh, sentences and 50 of them, obviously it's not possible to do it. People get bored. So they prefer our model slightly better. Um, okay, pretty much to the end. In conclusion, we have this um, uh, framework to enhance the common sense of a black, black, black box model, but we still require access to the output logics of a black, black box model. And secondly, we have this, um, we believe this framework is generalizable to many other downstream tasks because it's quite uh, labor and resource efficient. For example, if you want to do dialogue, simply replace this one uh, uh, pre-trained language model with a chatbot and then train your own how to get. Um, or um, if you have some other criteria you want to focus in terms of, com in addition to common sense, you also want to be safe. You also want to be uh, fulfilling the task. You can simply combine or multiply the score with some other scores if you have this evaluator in general. And that's all for today. Thank you. I found the last part, uh, the last slide where you showed that ChatGPT was actually less preferred than it was uh, oh. kind of interesting. And it raises some questions about, um, I think, like ACI aspects of, you know, like, Okay, we do have a model that's better at CS, but in actually being what is what is preferred, mm -hmm. and I feel like it could be very context specific here. Um, with this task, where I think the constraint having these three words, the idea sort of is like to come up with something that's commonsensical but also interesting. Like I think people have that expectation, but then when something dull comes out, they don't want it. Um, so I feel like maybe in a different context. Um, Maybe ChatGPT is still preferred overall. Um, I think it right. would be something, yeah, in right. a instruction following setting session, uh, for instance. So, do you have some ideas there? And, like, maybe for an instruction following setting, how um, concepts could be improved over uh, existing models? Um, I would say, um, I would say it's hard to predict from now. Like, uh, the best way is to uh, try to directly apply this pipeline into any instruction following. Like there is specific tasks you want the model to do and just see how well it does on this. And then based on its error types, try to make some adjustments. That would be my way of doing research. But I would agree if we uh, prompt the alert, but we, we don't have a prompt to generate uh, for chat GPT, to asking it to generate something that's really interesting and common sense code, but we do have a very large temperature to make sure everything is diverse and it's not very fixed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I missed this, but in your reference free uh, scoring uh, solution, you rely on extracting these tuples yes. from your sentence. Yes. Is it possible for a sentence to return no tuples at all? And in that case, how would you? return a scoreboard? Uh, this is definitely possible because we are limited to a few relation types. Mm -hmm. uh, pull this out. So it's definitely possible and it's actually occurred while we do research. So when we train these models uh, for uh, the prediction value, we'll simply disregard a, a sentence if we cannot extract anything. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Um, unfortunately, in the coming two weeks, uh, the NL seminar will be on pause due to schedule internal schedule conflicts. But we will be back in February twenty second with Ihan Wang giving us a talk on red teaming language models using language models. So, uh, thank you so much.